session of uh, today's meeting. We turn to begin with, please, to item 12.1, which is 62412201, which is uh, the proposed siting of five timber and canvas glamping safari tents, Manor Farm, Linton. Um, this is going to be presented by Mr. Badley. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, members. I'm presenting proposals for the application at Manor Farm. This includes the siting of five glamping safari tents, a permeable parking and turning area with associated footpaths, recycling and waste facilities, landscaping, and an underground water treatment plan plant. In accordance with the scheme of delegation, the application is being considered at committee as the officer recommendation of approval is contrary to the town council view. The application was deferred from the previous meeting of the planning committee to enable members to carry out a site visit which was undertaken on the 2nd of December. There has been no material change in the circumstances to the proposal and therefore the report and the officer's, re officer's recommendation of approval remain as before. The Exmoor National Park Future Landscapes Officer has provided a consultation response following the previous meeting. This is included within your update sheet. The officer response assesses the revised scheme and concludes that overall, it is now a more considered and appropriate proposal, more in keeping with the setting and landscape context. The application site is Manor Farm, a caravan site that accommodates tented camping, touring caravans and camper vans and also hosts holiday chalets. The site operates as Limmouth Holiday Retreat and is also known as Channel View Caravan Park. The existing site boundaries are formed with mature hedgerows and individual trees which separate the site from the A39 and the West Lynn Road to the east and south and from the West Lynn Farm and open fields to the north and west. The land area of Manor Farm is outlined in blue and the, south, and the site outlined in red. The entire site benefits from an existing grant of the Planning Commission in 1982 for the siting of tents for recreational purposes without any limitations on the number or layout of tents or the time of year or period within that time of year that tents can be erected. This slide shows the overlap between the proposed site and a lawful certificate of development decided in March 2021. The certificate confirms the use of the site for the siting of tents for recreational purposes all year round. It shows the current application would not constitute a material change of use of this land. This slide shows the proposed floor plans and elevations for each of the five glamping safari tents and associated decking. Each tent is built of a khaki coloured canvas with timber supports and an additional condition is proposed to ensure the development is constructed in accordance with these details to ensure a satisfactory visual relationship between the new development and its surroundings. The internal space of each tent would be 25 square metres, have a maximum height of 4 metres and as shown would include space for two beds, a sink, cooking hobs and a toilet, shower and sink within the bathroom. The proposals were amended follow, following initial consultation to remove four glamping tents and associated footpaths from the more visible northern section of the site. This would be to the top left of the image here, within the red line. The proposals are now for five glamping tents, three within the first section of the more secluded field and another two from this section led via the footpath. The proposals were also amended to reduce the amount of parking spaces from nine to six, reduce the size of the associated permeable hard standing, and the current proposals show a limited amount of parking and turning area adjacent to the internal road layout through the creation of a formal vehicle access to the southeast. The glamping pods are then accessed via footpath. The proposed landscaping plan shows the shrubbery and hedgerow introduced as part of the proposal. 
It demonstrates the maintenance of the existing shrubbery, bushes, meadow and cut grasslands, and it's noted the majority of the shrubbery and bushes within the northern section are retained <coughs> following the removal of the additional glamping tents in this location. The trees at the northern edge of the site are ash trees, and it has been confirmed that they appear to be affected by ash dieback within the site visits and would be replaced by new trees over a period of time. This is a benefit of the ongoing use of the site to protect it from wind and ongoing screening of the proposals. An additional condition is proposed to plant additional trees within the northern shrub area of the site. This will break up views of the new development and propose that details should be submitted and approved in accordance with the local planning authority and undertaken in accordance with these agreed details. I'm now going to go through some photographs of the site. This one here taken from the southeast, showing the location of the proposed vehicle entrance cut into hedgerow at this point, providing access to the new parking area and to the pods. This one showing the existing boundary treatment to the east, adjacent to the free glamping pods and the camping area, sorry, parking area, apologies. This photograph is taken facing the northern field and the boundary where the new proposed hedgerow will be placed. From this position, the footpath will lead to the from this position, the footpath will lead to the two new huts in the northern field. This shows the boundary between the existing camping field and the proposal site. This photograph is taken in a position facing north, showing the mature trees in the background and the sloping nature of the northern section of the application site. And the according adjacent, the according adjacent camping area. And this snapshot is taken from a position across the valley to the northwest of the site on Station Hill. It shows the site in the context of its surrounding landscape, and I note the right-hand side image has been zoomed in. In conclusion, the proposals for the siting of five safari glamping tents and associated works are considered to meet the requirements and objectives of the local plan, given the context of the lawful development certificate allows year-round camping across the whole application area. Specifically, the tents would provide low-impact holiday accommodation that meets the permanence tests of policies RTD5 and RTD9. The proposal is considered to be acceptable subject to the conditions attached, which seek to protect the night sky, the landscape, and to secure biodiversity enhancement. As previously mentioned, an additional condition is sought to ensure that proposed materials comply with the details of the materials section of the associated application form, and a further condition is sought <coughs> to plant additional trees within the northern shrub area of the site to break up views and ensure the visual impact of the proposal is acceptable. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Bradley. Uh, we have no public speakers on this item. This was the subject of a site visit last Friday. You will see, and you will all have read, I hope, the item 12.1 update from the Future Landscapes Officer. You've also heard from Mr. Badley that there are two additional conditions proposed, one for materials and one on additional planting. Members. Mr. Ellicott. Um, but on this photograph, is it possible to show exactly where the uh, campsite is on either of those photographs? There's no marking to show where it is. Thank you for your query. Um, looking at the cursor on the image on the bottom right shows the existing mature tree and the tree line which exists at the northern boundary of the site. The site is in this area here and will be screened by existing planting. Find those trees. Lovely. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Mr. Ellicott. 
Dr Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I did have the benefit of the, the site visit. It was extremely useful. Um, several members came along to that. Um, I've noted the further views of the landscape officer. Um, essentially, the applicants are making the case that because there is a certificate of lawfulness, uh, the proposed change of use from the 1982 consent uh, tents for recreational purposes uh, to glamping units um, with associated parking and the groundworks and excavation would be acceptable as it raises no material change in planning circumstances. Um, but clearly it's development because it requires planning permission. So it is open to us to refuse this application or to approve it, of course. So they can't, with due fairness to the applicant's agents, rely solely on that planning history. It's before us today to make a decision on its individual merits. And on, <coughs> on those merits, um, it was clear to me at least that this site isn't really just one site. There are two sites. There's the well-managed, uh, established part of the campsite uh, for the three glamping lodges. And there's the scrubland that's not been used and is not capable and has not been capable of being used for tended camping for many decades. And that scrubland is particularly noticeable and it's particularly noticeable from across the valley and I did take the opportunity to look at it from Station Road. And the landscape officer's initial comments uh, made the point uh, that uh, it would be very noticeable without uh, bearing in mind the significant excavation that would be required. And hence its present use, uh, as members who attended the site visit could see, is as a dog exercise area. And it's not been used for any form of tented camping in the past. So I understand the landscape officer's concerns over the significant uh, excavations, which will be very noticeable. I've noted the latest comments, which refers to less harm, which implies, I guess, that it's still harm. Uh, but the initial observations talked about uh, the significant excavations, which will be very noticeable. Now, I don't think they would be particularly noticeable in respect to the southern part of the site for the three glamping lodges, but they would be very noticeable in respect to the northern part of the site and the two lodges. Um, and Linton Town Council have also voiced similar concerns, and they've made the point that it's not been, the northern part of the site has not been used for camping and is fenced off scrubland. Bearing in mind the first statutory purpose uh, to which we must have regard to conserve and enhance the natural beauty uh, of the National Park, and without questioning the certificate of lawfulness, which is not before us today to do, um, in my view at this, this second element, the northern part of the site, would very noticeably conflict with a number of the policies, including the first statutory purpose, and to my mind, is in conflict with a number of the policies of the adopted local plan. Uh, notably, policy CES1, uh, RTS1, Recreation and Tourism, RTD5, which refers to tented campsites, and RTD9, which was referred to in respect of alternative uh, camping accommodation. So, with the benefit of the site inspection, my view is that Unfortunately, the L this application has to be considered uh, before us, which is for all five. Three of the elements, three of the glamping lodges are acceptable. I'm not suggesting we're looking at a split decision. And if we're not able to do that, uh, then I would move that we refuse the application for those reasons. Right. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. So you've moved it on the grounds of conflict with policies CS1, RT, S1, RTD5 and RTD9? Yes. Thank you. Is that seconded, please? Yes, I'd follow those uh, observations precisely. Thank you. Right, moved and seconded. Um, I've got then um, uh, Councillor Smith and then Councillor Lay. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you. Um, I was interested in the removal of the ash trees and what will replace them and when. So I was, I was going to ask, can a condition be added with a time scale? Because I'm concerned that the, there are mature trees on the site and how long will it take for, you know, I mean, you, I don't know what you call a tree when you replace it, if it's a whip or if it's got to be a full-scale tree. So I'm concerned about that loss of screening. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, as we noted earlier, there is an additional planting um, condition that is proposed, but we, should we move to a, approval, then uh, we can consider that at that point. Um, Mr. Lay. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, two, two, three points. <laughs> Having seen a few site visits in the past, I'm thinking about it afterwards, this is probably the most enlightening site visit I've ever been on. And it's primarily because of what I would call the second plot. The first plot is perfect, but the second one gives all the appearance of you know, your original rewilded site. Um, my experience of land manage management tells me that this would be untouched by human hand for 30, 40 years, or machinery come to that. And that, that can be emphasised a bit for anyone who took notice of the wire fence that was part in that element from what's used for camping above. That fence would have been there from anything between 30 and 50 years. Um, it's yeah, yeah, the condition of it is dire with, with age. Now, w whether or not this land has been tried for tenting in the past, it could have been, but I suspect it was for a very limited period, purely because of you know the grip slope, the gradient of its slope. Um, I've never seen a, um, land as steep as that ever been used for tenting purposes. Um, there would have to be significant earthworks, you know, to, to make a, a stand-in for these clamping pots were, were it approved. The, I always understood that the um, granting of a certificate of lawful use was based <coughs> on a proven, established use. Well, I'm really scratching my head to see. I, I accept it's been granted. But I would ask the question, did the person who granted it visit the site? But that's a, that's a question I guess is going to be irrelevant for today. Um, yeah, it, it's w w just looking at it, you, without visiting the site, you cannot appreciate the two different elements. It is as different as chalk and cheese. And I think the technical bits that Dr. Kelly added is pertinent to this case, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I, I support entirely what he said there. Thank you. Mr. Thwaites. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, the, the scrub land itself, um, I don't know about you, but my experience has been is that um, brambles can grow tremendously in a year. I've uh, just taken a bramble out, which has grown at least 20 foot in one year. So looking at the scrubland, yes, there has been a, a period of time when it's obviously been allowed to go wild. But that could happen over a couple of years to get exactly like that is, because I've got some land that I haven't touched for two years, and it's just like that. So I would have <laughs> a little bit of a concern about that. It, it, brambles and things grow very, very fast. You don't realise that they're there and all of a sudden there's a whole bush of brambles. Um, the idea of, clam of camping on a slope, um, I must admit in my youth I do remember camping on a slope and sliding out of the tent overnight to find myself outside. So it is possible, but there will be some engineering work, that's true, that will be necessary. Thank you. Are there any other members who wish to speak? Ms. Blanchard. Just a comment, really, that I agree with, with uh, Dr. Kelly's observations about the um, scrub area. But looking at the photograph uh, that you put on as the last photograph in the presentation, there was still quite a lot of leaf cover there. And when we went round to have a look from Station Hill, those leaves had largely gone, and the site was much more obvious than it would give the impression there. And the applicant did comment about the ash dieback in that screening. Um, I suppose it's a grown out hedgerow, I'm not quite sure. So we would, if we were to grant this, we would need to get some planting in there pretty quickly because those ash are going to die. Um, so yeah, I do have 
serious concerns about the, the long distance view. Right, thank you. Are there any other members who wish to speak? Well, it has been proposed by Dr. Kelly and seconded by Mr. Milne that this application should be refused for the reasons that Dr. Kelly um, adumbrated. Unless the planning officers wish to come back with any points, I will put it to the meeting. Is that a yes or a no, Mr. Kinsella? Yes, OK. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, ju just before you do go to the vote, just, just as a point of clarity, because over the last couple of meetings we've had quite a lot of discussion around the uh, planning history and the um, suitability of granting a certificate of lawfulness. Um, while it is right and proper, that isn't for consideration here today. As a matter of fact, there is a certificate that establishes the use of the land that's the subject of this application um, for, for a um, uh, holiday accommodation use in terms of tented, um, tented accommodation. Um, the, the, the reason for, for granting the certificate related back to a 1982 planning permission, which identified the area as being potentially able to, to accommodate tents. Now, that in terms of the certificate was established that that permission had been implemented and therefore the fact that it may or may not have been used for the last 10 or 15 years was, was somewhat of an academic exercise. It was the fact that they had implemented the planning permission and that planning permission hadn't lapsed or been abandoned in its entirety. So that's, that's the reason for that. Um, also, just to touch on the um, engineering works associated with the, the proposals. The application talks about minimising the um, amount of engineering, so it won't need, for example, retaining walls or structures to hold back earth. It's on a decked platform, so it will be piles into the ground. So, again, just while you're considering the impact on a surrounding landscape, it's worthwhile having that in, in your mindset as well. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you. Um, so it has been moved and seconded that we should refuse this application. May I see all those in favour of refusal? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And all those against that? One, two, three, four. Any abstentions? One, two, three abstentions. So that um, stands refused. Thank you very much, Mr. Badley. Is M Mr. Tivy with us? So, a uh, quick change at the top table, and we move on to 627.22.118, which is Keel Rise, Hawkham, Horlock. This was also the subject of a site visit last Friday. Um, and this uh, is going to be presented by Mr. Tivy. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, you'll be familiar with the site, so I won't give a full presentation. Um, but we have received three additional letters of support since the last committee meeting, um, dominantly raising the same sort of issues that are listed within the report. Um, also, entirely clear from here, but the, the appeal site is in this location here, if you can see where the cursor is. Um, <coughs> so the boundary just runs through the frontage of the application site. And then I've got a couple of photographs. That one is better than the one I posted last time round. And, uh, and this is a view taken from across the cemetery. Is it, just that we have oh, sorry, yes. Yep. Within uh, that area there. Um, so really, I, I, I will just sort of refer you to the recommendation. Um, and the policy CS6 states that development should utilise traditional, natural, sustainable construction materials. And the policy CED3 states that...
proposals affecting conservation areas and their settings should ensure that they incorporate materials that reflect the scale, architectural quality and detailing of the area. Um, so the officer recommendation, as before, is to refuse based on the grounds that the fibre cement cladding um, isn't congruent with traditional weatherboarding found within the National Park and is not deemed natural. Consequently, it's considered that it would give rise to harm to the character and appearance of the, the, character and appearance of the setting of the conservation area and also cause unacceptable harm to the landscape setting of the National Park as well. Thank you. Mr. Petrinos, you wanted to say something at this point oh, before the public speakers? No, after. Okay. Well, right. Right. Thank you very much. Anyway. Yeah. I, I have other speakers as well, but thank you very much. Um, we have two public speakers on this item. The first is Mr. Burton, who is acting as planning consultant to um, Louise Crossman <coughs> Architects. And then we have Mr. Keel, the applicant. Mr. Burton, you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. Thank you, and I probably won't take the, the, the two minutes. All I, all I want to say is that I'm sure I don't need to tell you that your local plan is your starting point for all the planning decisions you make. But it is that. It is only the starting point. The policies in the plan then need to be balanced against other material considerations. I believe that the material considerations that relate to this application, as will be set out and explained by, by the applicant, provide you with justification to come to a different conclusion to that set out in your officer's report and to grant planning permission. However, these considerations are specific to this case and specific to this site, and thereby, by allowing this particular application, I don't believe that you will be undermining the future implementation of the relevant policies elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burton. And we now have Mr. Keel, who is the applicant. Mr. Keel, if you could come forward to the microphone, and again, you'll have two minutes from when you start to speak. Apologies, I'm not a public speaker, all right? So if I start fading, I apologise. The rest of us aren't either, so that's fine. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to apologise again for not seeking permission for the cladding change before fitting and thank the Exmoor National Park for giving us permission to build in the first place in 2016. Uh, we always had every intention of fitti fitting the uh, Western Red Cedar, but during the massive learning curve of self-building, which we've not done before, we were advised to investigate into more efficient, cost-effective products, not to mention the constraints and cost of obtaining local timber during COVID and financial restrictions we have incurred along the way. Uh, we are a dedicated community involved local Porlock family with two young children, myself being born and bred, my wife Kelly working at the uh, Porlock School, along with having two small businesses in the village. We are committed to the, village, to the village and its people and the massive local support we have received over this matter uh, we are truly grateful for. Also, as an interesting fact for me, the two objections we had uh, were both from people with no local connection and both own holiday homes in the area. Having basic knowledge of DIY, we have relied upon advice from professional suppliers, uh, West Somerset Building Control, while undertaking our self-build and due to the points below, felt we had no choice but to fit what is a far superior product. Uh, Cedar Award is less than a third of the cost of the UK grown red cedar. It has uh, zero to low maintenance, resistance to coastal climate, mould and insect deterioration, um, as found down at uh, Chadwick, another estate in Porlock. As our neighbours explained, the challenge they had experienced with maintaining timber cladding at the site visit on Friday. Uh, it's made from recycled, ethnically produced materials, manufactured and is available in the UK. Unlike timber, Cedral has a class A fire rating, essentially with the large bonfires that happen in Hawkham, and even more of the concern that is uh, now that we know more about the tragedy that occurred at Green, uh, Grenfell. Uh, Cedral being available during COVID with a fixed price rather than red cedar, which was not available and when available it was a, an astronomic, astronomical price in comparison. Can I just finish? It's just one line, is that right? Uh, we understand we have made a mistake and apologise again. If we were forced to replace or paint the cladding, uh, it would really set us back uh, financially and time-wise for our family. Uh, we really hope this committee can support us so that we can finish our family home. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr Keel. That's great. Thank you. Right. Um, I have three speakers on my list at the moment. The first of them is Dr. Kelly. 
I don't think we need to get into a discussion at all as to whether red cedar or cedral fibre cement is a, a sustainable material. Um, it's certainly not a traditional material, but what we need to concentrate on, I think, having been on site, is whether, in fact, or what is indeed the, con the impact on the designated heritage asset, the conservation area. And the site visit was extremely useful uh, in setting out and showing the relationship of the site uh, with the designated conservation area and in cl clarifying, if you like, the circumstances uh, for the change in material. And in my view, the site visit showed that the impact on the setting of the adjacent conservation area was minor only, and not such as to result in material harm to the appearance and character of the designated conservation area. And I say that because of the small scale of the proposal, the muted colouring of the cladding, its wooded backdrop that you can see from the photograph, and if you like, its peripheral sighting on the edge of the designated conservation area. And on that basis, and without wanting to be contrary to officers, I would actually recommend that we approve this application. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you, Dr. Kelly. Is that seconded? Uh, Mr. Mill? Do you want to say anything, Mr. Mill? We're always trying to encourage affordable housing, and this is an exceptionally fine example of this. It doesn't affect the aesthetic um, uh, atmosphere of, uh, of, the, of the valley, and uh, none of the, or very few of the neighbours have actually protested against it. So, from my mind, this is an out should, we should be encouraging this sort of development rather than uh, preventing it from taking place. Thank you. Mrs Nicholson. I was merely going to second it, um, which uh, has, thank you, already really happened. And to say that I find it very helpful that you're going to the site visit, and, and particularly seeing the muted colour, um, which I thought was, was, was good. Um, I took the time after the site visit to drive around the loop of houses to look from the, the other side. And my impression, uh, which is where that, this photograph is taken from, that the... That what impact from, is, from the house is, is its, its height and its, its, its roof line rather than uh, anything to do with its, its, its colour and the cladding, which I think is entirely acceptable. Thank you. Um, Ms Blanchard? Um, I, I struggled with this one, really. Um, I do think that the cladding looks very artificial. I do think red cedar would have been preferable. I feel very great sympathy for the applicant and, and for me the decision, I, I, I would definitely say it is harmful that the decision is with the degree of harm and maybe it is minor harm rather than major harm but I do think it, it is a harmful material when you look I, I took the opportunity to look at, at ones in Barbrook and elsewhere as I've been um, travelling over Somerset this weekend and it's really clear to me that, that natural wood is far superior as far as the aesthetics go. As far as the sustainability goes, we do have suppliers of red cedar in Devon. Um, and I don't know about insect damage, um, but I would always go with the science rather than the surgeon. So if there is insect damage in future use, so then I'd like to know some science behind it and, and the difference between this and cedar. So, yeah, I think it is possibly a matter of, of individuals' opinion on just how detrimental it is, but I do feel it is detrimental. Mm. Well, I think that was really Dr. Keller's point. It was the degree to which it causes uh, material harm to the appearance and setting of the conservation area, and in Dr. Kelly's proposal, he's taking the view that it um, doesn't sufficiently to warrant us refusing the application, I think is Dr. Kelly's point. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Petrinos and then Mr. Thwaites. Thanks. Yeah, I wasn't able to go on the site visit, unfortunately, but I have read today's report and last week's report and the website and the report from the site visit, and I come to a different sort of conclusion to many of the previous speakers, and that, um, as the agent reminded us, we start with the local plan policies, and unless there's material considerations to vary from them, we, we um, don't. And the 
stimulus for the change in this case appears to be the difficulty in sourcing red cedar and the expense of it, which don't appear to me to be material considerations that we ought to be considering in um, determining the application. So, unfortunately, well, I've got a huge sympathy for the applicant, and um, I can understand you know, why, why he's doing it, and, and um, I also know the great need for affordable homes, but I can't really see myself supporting it. Uh, uh, Mr. Thwaites. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm uh, totally to the opposite. I see that uh, this material um, effect on the conservation area is very, very minimal. In fact, you wouldn't even know that there was a conservation area there on the basis. And to think that the people that objected to it are people that are in um, holiday homes, I think, is uh, certainly speaks for itself. So I, I believe that this is the best way forward on this. My concern about red cedar is if you look it up on the internet and it corresponds to what the neighbours were saying, red cedar will actually split, drive the nails and screws out and allow infestation of beetles, etc. This material is much longer life and uh, much more sustainable. I, I think um, I certainly approve what's been done here. Thank you very much, Mr. Thwaites. Again, can I just remind members that actually the, the Dr. Kelly's um, proposal very much is, is um, concentrating on the material harm to the appearance and setting of the conservation area, and therefore uh, that, that is the, the material consideration that is the basis for his proposal that it should be uh, accepted. Um, do I have any other speakers, please? Yes. Jeremy. I was just trying to give a little bit of uh, um, favour to those that attended the site visit and therefore can comment perhaps with more depth on uh, what they saw on the ground, which was the purpose of the site visit. Mr Chairman, I, I did attend the site visit uh, and of the previous application and, and viewed from Station Hill. Um, I don't think the impact is that great, but it would be very would have been very helpful for members who weren't able to go on the site visit had there been a proper landscape visual impact assessment. I've said this before, and I'm sorry for, for uh, repeating it again, but there is a method of, of looking at the impact and in, in an um, objective fashion, um, and I would urge the authority to consider advising um, people who have proposals such as this and the proposal that we've heard earlier today that a landscape visual assessment is done um, and made available for, for those who have to make the decisions. Right. Any other comments, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Lay. Just, <coughs> just, a, just a brief one. A reference, again, actually seeing it, you know, the impression I got when seeing it is that the colour that stands out here now was far, far much more muted when you were close to the property. Whether my eyesight is totally deceiving me, I don't know. But what, what I've found quite interesting is that the debate on a property like this is usually around the um, windows and doors and their material. But here we have it the opposite way around. Um, and my conclusion on site was, uh, from a visual perspective, it fitted in like a hand in a glove. Now, I don't say that lightly, but that was a strong personal. Um, uh, as for the aspects of the, the, the policies that has just been read out to you, I'm not going to touch on. But f from a visual perspective, and also, the co I guess, the impact on the conservation area is key to this decision. And actually being there, it t to me, did not impact on that conservation area. But that's just a personal opinion. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off by repeating something that's been said a couple of times, so I think it's worth just emphasising. So um, in making the decision here today, members need to um, 
uh, sort of considered the development plan. Um, and some of the, the um, emphasis I would put on it is the guidance generally talks about decisions must be taken in accordance with the development plan unless there are material considerations that would indicate otherwise for you to come to a different decision. Now, just thinking about those material considerations, you will have heard um, over the last couple of meetings there's been reference to the efficiency of the product in line with building regulations. That isn't a material consideration for you to consider today. There is also um, concerns around the, um, the personal circumstances of the applicant. And of course, we all sympathize with the, the applicant. And in certain limited situations, that can be a material consideration. Your officer's recommendation to you today is that we haven't heard anything that I would say are so exceptional that they would form part of a material consideration. And there is also <coughs> the concern around uh, safety. Now, timber in terms of a form of cladding is a widely used product for, for cladding, whether that's part of an extension, a whole building, or a small section of it. And there are various ways that it can be treated. So it is a viable product that can be used on a, on a residential property. I would then also urge caution around comparing uh, this application site to matters such as Grenfell. That's a very different product, a very different product, different materials, and we need to be very careful that um, we, don't, we don't get those two, two materials confused. I would then take you back to the, the policy um, and the relevant policy, sorry, um, and that being, um, <coughs> remind myself, CES6, um, and um, <coughs> which talks about sustainable construction principles. And uh, specifically um, under the policy, it talks about development proposals should deliver high quality sustainable designs that can serve and enhance the local identity and distinctiveness of Exmoor's built-in historic environment. And in doing so, applicants will be expected to demonstrate the following design principles, and there are a list of them. The one I would um, tease out and discuss with you today is, is Category B, which talks about the materials and the design elements of a new building or conversion of an existing building should complement the local context through the use of traditional and natural sustainable building materials and that the use of locally sourced sustainable building materials will be encouraged. Now, in that context, I'd invite you to look at the preamble to the policy, and in particular, um, paragraphs 4.152, and that talks about the use of traditional natural materials is critical to ensuring that the appearance of new development conserves and enhances the quality and the character of the built environment. Again, in paragraph 4.14, it talks about other local materials identified include timber, earth and cob, straw bale and green roofs. Um, and it talks about economic benefit of those being sourced locally. And you would have heard today from, from one of the members, uh, Linda, talk about there, there potentially being some, some local source of that material. And then again, at paragraph 4.155, it makes specific re uh, reference to timber as a, as a high quality product. Timber is one of the most versatile materials as it can be used, for uh, can be used structurally as cladding or roof shingles or for windows and doors. Um, and it goes on to say that the National Park Authority will encourage the use of natural sustainable materials in the design of new development. So while I understand you are making a judgment based on the specifics of the site, there is nothing that I've heard here today that would lead me to come to a view that there are material considerations that are significant enough that would warrant going against the policies within the plan. Now, clearly, that is the choice and the decision to be made by members here this afternoon, um, and I will allow you to, um, to come to a view on it. But I do think we need to think very carefully in, in, in that context when considering the, the proposal. Kelly. Yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> the, uh, the reason for approving the application I was putting forward didn't take into account any of these extraneous considerations. It simply looked 
at the circumstance, and if we look at the reason for refusal, it talks about its installation has caused material harm to the character and appearance of the setting of the conservation area. And what I was putting forward, and seconded by Councillor Milne, was on the basis of the reasons that I set out it's not considered to cause material harm to the setting of the appearance and character of the conservation area. Nothing else was taken into account, simply centred on that. And on that basis, I moved approval of the application. I take it you're still moving that, Dr Kelly? I am. Thank you. Mr Chairman, thank you very much for allowing me to come back for a second time. Um, I think there is another <coughs> material factor that we should be considering, and it's not been mentioned yet, and that is in the local plan under controlling affordability, and I'm talking about paragraph 6.49 and 6.50. Um, they are rather long, so I wasn't going to read them out, um, but basically this section looks at keeping houses affordable uh, and the interesting wording can be found in 6.50 um, where it is saying that, that the effect of having an affordable house will mean that it is of lower value and it is requiring people making applications for affordable housing to bear in mind certain things and these include the price they pay for the site, the land, building construction and finishing reflects its reduced market value in addition to limiting size and type, etc. Uh, if you look at those two paragraphs, you can understand why the applicant uh, would have gone for the materials that he has gone for. Uh, and it is unfortunate that all this happened during COVID and there was not, there was not the interaction between the applicant and, and the planning authority, which it's clear that they regret now. But I would suggest that there is a material consideration that is included within the local plan. Mr Milne? Mr Lay? J just, just a general point. Um, I've always been told, an assistant at various planning meetings, that the local plan or any plan has to be read as a whole. Now, we've just heard bits from one part of it and bits from another. I think it's dangerous to be listening to po spe specific paragraphs without reading the whole lot. You, uh, Mr. Olson. Just very quickly, I think we've come across this before where we've, we've, we've got into a situation of usually about windows, but about what is a traditional material. Um, and, um, and, and I think it's worth pointing out that fibre cement, if you drive around Exmoor as an Ill in, uh, a fairly uninformed person, not knowing the whole uh, policy inside out, you'll see a huge, more, probably more fibre cement than you'll see timber. Um, it, it, and in Exmoor, it, it is almost chloric. Uh, actually qualifies as a traditional material. I know in this context it's different and cladding a house is different from cladding an agricultural shed, um, but uh, I'd also sort of say that one shouldn't get too hung up, I think, on this idea of traditional materials being confined only to timber when there are variants of using timbers and fibres and resins and cements uh, that actually now are always forming new materials that perform better and more importantly, as Mr. Kelly, Dr. Kelly has pointed out, actually do not have any material landscape harm. Thank you. Right, we're going around in circles now a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, so I think I'm going to put this to the meeting. Uh, so it's been proposed and seconded by, um, proposed by Dr. Kelly that notwithstanding the use of the materials, you believe that it does not cause material harm to the appearance and setting in the conservation area. Yes? Hazel, do you wish to comment? I'll just borrow your microphone, Chair. Um, because this is a grant of permission, uh, Mr. Kinsella needs to advise in terms of conditions and also a deed of variation to bring the existing section 106 from the original permission over to this new consent. Right. Do you wish to do that before the results or after the vote? Yes. After? Yes, sure. Mr. Kinsella, could you advise us accordingly, please? Certainly can. So, um, as Hazel's just pointed out, there, there will be a need for the um, section 106 be varied as that will need to be updated for any new planning permission that's granted 
There will also be a uh, number of planning conditions that were imposed on the previous uh, approval. And if you just bear with me a moment, I will um, run through them very well as quickly as I can, um, just so members are are clear on on what we are talking about. So first of all, there'll there'll be a need to um, have a, a a condition that sets out the the plans that are now um, approved. Um, there will also be a need to have a condition which seeks to ensure that the the natural slate that has has been placed on the roof is is retained. There was also uh, conditions regarding uh, a garden store that was approved, um, and uh, materials uh, should be provided with that, um, and also. Uh, details regarding the garden store in terms of a, a sedum or a green roof. Um, the fact that there would be need to be a conditions to do with a consolidation of the, the surface access, um, uh, that will need to be repeated, as will the disposal of surface water to ensure it doesn't discharge onto the highway. Um, there is then a, uh, a further condition which seeks the removal of a, an existing mobile home uh, on the site. Those who attended the visit would have would have seen it, um, and we we will need to reimpose that. Um, although that that wording will need to be changed a little bit because they they would automatically be in uh, contrary to to that condition. Um, ensuring the retention of the uh, timber doors and windows. Um, and the removal of permitted development rights. A need for a condition to do with the um, services to be um, cabled underground, that no floodlights or other forms of external lighting being installed without first seeking permission from the planning authority. Um, there's uh, a further condition here that talks about external frames. Windows shall have a minimum, uh, minimum of 100 mil reveal. And uh, finally, you'll be glad to hear, the uh, garden store building here by proof shall only be used for domestic storage, so controlling the use. Now, I would advise that, um, that the final wording is delegated to officers. Uh, it will, by and large, marry what, what's already on the decision notice, but there will be need for some, some changes, as I've, as I've discussed. So should it be approved, you've heard what Mr. Kinsella says. And that you'll be resolving to grant planning per, um, planning permission subject to all of the things I've just talked about, so it won't be issued today. Right, so the motion from Dr. Kelly is to um, resolve to grant permission subject to the conditions outlined by Mr. Kinsella and the other items he noted specifically the deed of variation. May I see all those in favour, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Any against? One, two, three, four. Any abstentions? One abstention. So uh, that stands granted. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Moving on. So we're now on page 27, which is 642-22109. And this is East Holocombe Hawkridge, proposed direction of Dormer. And this is going to be presented by Mr. Tivy. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a proposal for a dormer and um, the rear roof slope of the property at East, or known as East Holocombe. It's a two-storey house situated within Hawkridge. It's identified by the red line there on the aerial photograph. The principal reason behind it is to increase the head height. It's very difficult to ascertain from that drawing, but there's a, a blue hatch line there which denotes where the um, dormer 
or probably more accurately described, uh, so a gable would be constructed. Um, if I just flick through to the photos, you will note at the moment that there's this large expanse of cat slide roof. Uh, the northwestern corner is in very close proximity to the public highway here. Um, and also you'll note that there's quite a significant change in levels. And if I just show you the other photographs. So the cat slide roof um, is untouched, essentially apart from two roof lights. And you'll notice there the proximity to the road. Just going back to the drawing, so the proposal is to install so what, I, what I'd term a, a, a gable projection really in, in that location there. Um, it is to uh, a traditional building, um, the, the dwelling and the surrounding farm buildings are listed on the historic environment record. Um, I believe the house is, it dates back to late 17th century. So, as you'll note from the committee report, it's considered that the proposed materials and the overall design intend to be in keeping with the character and appearance of the host dwelling. And obviously, it's considered you know, in two dimensional form. You know, one would um, probably consider that there isn't that much wrong with it. But the issue being really is, is the very fact that, due to the proximity to the road, the very fact that you have this rather interesting, quite unique um, expanse of cat slide roof that the proposal would appear in Congress within the street scene. Um, so consequently, it's considered it would give rise to a, an alien form of development that would be harmful to the character and appearance of the area, um, which would be in conflict with those policies within the local plan that are listed within the report. Um, including policy CES4 and CES5, as well as the National Planning Policy Framework, which places a great emphasis on high-quality design. So the officer recommendation is to refuse. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Tilly. We have one public speaker, and that is Mrs. Silverlock, who is speaking as a local yeah, resident. Um, so uh, we're... We're just talking about the uh, direction of the dormer, aren't we? Yes, Barnes with different applications. Sorry. Different applications, right. Yes. Okay. I have one short paragraph then on the headroom issue. Um, increased headroom um, is going to tidy up that rear view. That rear view is, is, did you say patchy? I think it's scruffy. It looks really peculiar. Um, and I think something that will tidy up that view would, is um, all to the good and it has local support if that's anything. You, you are speaking as a local resident? I, am, I live opposite. Thank you. Right, thank you very much Mrs Silverlock. Um, now we move to member debate and Mrs Nicholson. Thank you Mr Chairman. I live in an old farm house. Um, that has, is older than that and has cat side roofs in various places and um, has been altered over time. There are things that I think are, are, are enormously important and one of them is they're both equally important I'll start with, with, with the, the easier one one is to be able to read what's happened to the building, how it's been used by people, how it's grown or not grown over the centuries with the use and, it, and its function. And it's really, really important that should not be wrecked. Um, it's also, I think, important that it is possible for buildings to be used over time and to be used in current circumstances as well as past ones. It's also really important how these buildings sit in the landscape, um, what the street scene is, what the overlooking of it is, um, what, what can be seen from where. 
this is a I mean, pleasant is the word used in, 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 in its description. It's right, it is. It's very pleasant. Um, it's up against the road, it's, but, but it sits well below the road. You don't really see all that much of the house. Um, as most people, I'm afraid, drive by rather than walk by, people who live in the village will see it. But otherwise, it's extraordinarily unobtrusive and unnoticeable. <coughs> to put this Dormer in, and I, I, I see the, the, the point of the saying the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional, because um, two-dimensional, absolutely fine, no question. Three-dimensional, then you need to think about what you're doing when you're walking along the road. Well, there aren't all that many people walking along the road, but that's another question. Um, does, it, does, it, does it make... Does it, fu does it look as though it will increase the function, make it, make it better? Yes, it does. Does it look... Like that, does it look as though it fits in the sort of place that it is? Yes, it does. Um, does it stop you reading that great cat's eye roof? No, it doesn't. And you, uh, you, you see at the end when you look at, uh, when you when you look there, and particularly if you look at the other end of it, um, that that roof, the bottom end of it, is itself an extension. Um, it wasn't there to begin with. That extension um, looks slightly odd from there. Um, because of the kick-out, but you know why the kick-out is there, and it's part of its, its, its history. Um, I think, I feel that adding the dormer window, adding to the functionality, uh, enabling the history to be read, not, I think, damaging the pleasantness of the house in the landscape, the lack of impact given the location where it is sunk down below the road there and really only visible for a few yards and the fact that it appears within the community to be considered to be something that they're not objecting to and would welcome in their scene makes me feel that it would be appropriate to propose this as being consonant with our policies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, are you proposing that we I should approve the application, Mrs. Nicholson? Proposing. Okay. Is that seconded, please? By Mrs. Weber. Do you wish to speak, Mrs. Weber? I totally agree with the opposite. Lady. Thank you. So you're seconding that in total agreement with Mrs. Nicholson. Right, thank you. Mr. Petrinos? Thank you. It's um, just a query, really, about, about the recommendation in the report. At the bottom of page 31, it talks about policy GP1 and policy CES6, about neighbourhood immunity, and said so basically there's not a problem with these two. But when it comes to the recommendation, it includes those in the list of policies that the um, that the this is meant to be in conflict with. So I'm a bit confused. Uh, indeed, I think we see from what the parish council has written, in addition to what Mr. Silverlock has said, that there is no issue uh, that the local population has with it at all. And so we're assuming that the proposal doesn't have an impact upon the living conditions of local residents. Um, I, I think it's a case of um, obviously one policy will deal with multiple things. You know, when, when we look at uh, CES6, for example, that, that's to do with the, the general design and sustainable construction principles again, and it does deal with sort of loss of daylight, overbearance appearance, um, overlooking, and things of that nature. But then it also talks about you know development should have high quality sustainable design. Well, the reason for refusal says we don't think it is high quality sustainable design, and so therefore. Um, the, the fact that we've, we've acknowledged that the policy seeks to conserve amenity as a good design principle, and I think we'd all agree with that, doesn't mean that we can't find it, that it falls foul of a different part of the policy, and when you read the policy as a whole, we feel that it, it, it fails to, to meet that, that policy objective. Ms. Davis. Can I just ask a question? Can we go back to the 
take pictures of the plant, please. I'm, I mean, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, I don't have a better idea of where it's coming. I think I do have to disagree with the previous speakers that I do feel it's very harmful to that building and that particular roof. It's a lovely roof. It, it will be passed by a lot of people on the road, even if they are driving. They've still got a right to, to enjoy a lovely historic building. And yes, it does reflect the changes of the building. But to me, that turns it into almost one of the night farm houses, that extension, rather than the building that it started out to be. Um, so I would be supporting the officer recommendation. Dr Kelly? I agree with the last speaker. I think the <coughs> officer recommendation is the correct one. I think it's a very uh, clum rather clumsy design. And if you look at it from the road, remember the height of the road and the photographs are very helpful there. Uh, you see how dominant that will be when viewed from that public vantage point. So uh, with respect, I disagree with one or two of the earlier speakers. I think it, uh, if it has not been sensitively designed, which is on the wording of the policy, and it doesn't necessarily complement, well, it doesn't complement uh, Exmoor's historic environment. It's a non-designated heritage asset going back to the 17th century. It's not sensitively designed, in my view, and I think the officer recommendation is the correct one. Ms. Davis? Well, I haven't got anything to write, because basically I was going to say that. Um, I think the only thing I'll say is just to say why I won't be um, I will be supporting off the recommendation, is the reason I asked for the previous slide to go back up. So it is all about, it, it is right on the road there. If you look at that bottom left-hand photo picture, that actually, not this, on the previous slide, that actually doesn't even give it the severity that it is. The road is right at the corner of the roof line on the picture. That is going to be so bulky and incongruous that I think there's only one way I can go. I suspect your view might be coloured by how well or otherwise you know the village and therefore the exact position of the uh, house in relation to the road. Uh, uh, other members have to speak first. Mr Lay. You've led me into this question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a member of the committee, you've passed this dwelling and know this dwelling better than all of us put together. Is it appropriate for you to give us comments, guidance, stroke, recommendations? To be honest, Mr. Lair, I'm afraid I don't think it is. Um, much as I might like to, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to say that at this juncture at any rate. Was there somebody else here that wanted to speak? No? Uh, anything else you wanted to add, Mr Kinsella? Only just to make the point, um, design is many things. Partly is where you can see it from and where else, but, but it's not the whole reason. The fact that you can't see something doesn't make it good design. So if it's poor design because of some of the things that have been said here today in terms of the impact it has on the character of the existing building, what the building currently reflects, then, then it's, it's, it's poor design whether you can see it or not. So I just emphasise that. Thank you. Right. It has actually been moved and seconded that this should be approved. Thank you, Chair. As the motion on the table is to grant permission, then again, members will need to hear conditions from the planning officer before you go to the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Um, yeah, so the, there would, I think officers only recommend three conditions. One is the normal standard time condition. Two is the standard um, plans condition. And the third one be, would be a, a condition to ensure that the materials match the existing property. Mr. Trinos, and then I will put it to vote. Could you just remind me of the reasons for the recommendation, for the motion? Um, I think I'm right in saying that um, both in terms of the appearance of the design um, in the uh, opinion of Mrs. Nicholson, um, it allows the uh, readability of the history of the house. Um, it doesn't cause any significant impact upon the uh, street scene or local residents. 
um, and therefore, uh, under those con um, particular um, heads, there is no reason for this not to be granted planning permission. That is precisely my, my reasoning, um, at, to which I could add it looks flat into a very, uh, uh, straight into an extremely high bank the other side of the road, yeah. six feet away. Unless there's a new point, Mr. Holtam, I am going to put this to the vote. Is it, is it a significantly new point? I believe it might be, because I, I, there is another policy that I think should be taken into account here, which is CED4, which says new additions or extensions to existing buildings should accord with the relevant planning policy consideration in terms of the existing or proposed use of the building and will only be permitted where A, they will complement the form, character and setting of the original building, B, the extension is appropriate in terms of scale and massing, and C, the roof line of any extension respects the form and symmetry of the original building. Uh, I would suggest we should be considering that policy. The roof line, does it? It it changes the shape of the roof, but it doesn't break the roof line. Uh, well, I listened intently to the policy, Mr. Holt. Anyway, that's by the by. Unless there is anything else, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to put this to the vote. May I see all those in favour, please? Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. Right, so that one is lost. So, um, I think I will now need somebody to propose the um, something else. Thank you. By Ms. Blanchard. So, it's moved by Ms. Davis, seconded by Mrs. Blanchard. Any debate? Hmm? Well, I saw, I saw Linda, but, but if Evelyn wishes to third it, that's fine. <laughs> Right, if there's no further debate, um, it's been moved that it should be refused. May I see all those in favour? Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you. So that therefore stands refused. Moving on, please, to um, item 6, 106. This is the Pinkery Centre, and this again is going to be presented by Mr Tilly. Thank you, Chair. I'm sure most members are aware of uh, the Pinkery Centre owned by the National Park Authority and that's why this application is before you this afternoon. Um, <coughs> the proposal is to erect a replica Bronze Age roundhouse within this approximate area here of the woodland to the west of the centre itself. These are the drawings showing the location. <coughs> Here's, here are the elevations. Floor plans, roof plan. If you're located in approximately this location here, here's a closer up um, view of, of the site's location. You'll note that there's a slight slope on the land and there would in fact be the need to remove two trees, two six of spruce trees um, from the land, but in accordance with the overall management plan, it is proposed to remove those trees in any case and replace them with broadleaf tree and Scots pine mixes. Um, I think it's probably not much more for me to say about the proposal itself obviously it's to enhance the educational offer for visitors to the centre and um, you will have noticed as well and received <coughs> yesterday a, an update to the agenda report because when the committee report was originally drafted the consultation period hadn't ended so there's the separate sheet that um, that was emailed out yesterday um, it includes um, consultation responses from Exmoor Parish Council who support the application, Natural England who raised no objection and Exmoor's Wildlife Conservation Officer 
it makes a number of points with regards to ecology and the need to consult the tree officer. Uh, the tree officer has also responded. Um, he makes reference to the two Sitka spruce trees which would be affected, um, but basically states that they have little or mean to your ecological value. Um, but he, notwithstanding the fact that he recommends that, quite rightly, they be felled prior to works commencing, that um, they be replaced by a suitable broadleaf and or Scots pine tree and shrub mix. There are also um, some additional conditions on that update sheet um, that have, have flown, stemmed from the consultation responses. Um, and just just one sort of correction to condition seven. Um, on the third line, it says um, woodlands shall be removed. In brackets, should insert outside of the bird nesting season of 1st of March to the 30th of August inclusive. Um, one would hope that uh, the National Park Authority would, would adhere to that anyway, but it, it certainly you know, makes sense to impose that for um, the avoidance of doubt, uh, particularly perhaps for any third party contractors in, involved. Uh, just finally as well, I also realise that um, there isn't a reason imposed for Condition 7, um, but the wording would be the same as for conditions five and six. So the officer recommendation is to approve planning permission subject to the conditions set out within the committee report and those additional three conditions with condition seven amended to include the bird resting season, nesting season. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you Mr. T. Uh, we have one speaker who is Mr. Totterdall. If you'd like to come to would you mind coming to the microphone, please, Mr. Stoddle? Thank you. Two minutes from when you start to speak. Yep. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I don't think I'll need two minutes. It was really just to um, reiterate the added value that this would give to our educational offer, um, I think both for existing groups, because um, it will enable us to offer a um, whole another range of activities based around um, you know, this building and uh, the history that it represents. Um, it will also help Pinkery, I think, to um, be competitive. So you know, we might be coming into times where it is a more competitive market. So I think something like this as an addition will help us to be more competitive against other similar offers. I think there's also, as well as our traditional educational groups, um, I do have some um, experience many years ago, I worked um, in um, Pembrokeshire National Park in Castle Henley, so where they've got some, um, some Iron Age style roundhouses and saw the benefits that that brought, not only to the educational groups, but also just the amazing space that these buildings create. So I think there's a real opportunity there um, you know, with, with other groups beyond school groups, for sort of health and wellbeing groups or, or other groups that might want to utilise that space as well. So I think it would be a really great addition. There's also some real positive opportunities that we can engage with volunteers um, of all ages to help in the construction of this, so they will actually be learning um, you know, about um, how roundhouses were built, what the materials were, what the challenges were, so there's a real opportunity there um, in the construction as well as once we've actually had it constructed. Very much, Mr. Shot at all. Mr. Alcott. Yes, I propose that we approve this um, application. It will definitely help to enhance the offer at Pinkley. Thank you. Is that seconded, please? Yes, Mrs. Blanchard. So, yeah, I think the idea is, is very good. I'm um, very pleased that you're, you're looking at involving the community in the build um, and I, I think a couple of points um, Ben will probably recall another round hut not so far not so many miles from here um, there is a problem with the um, durability of materials obviously you know, the technology isn't the same as today we're looking at a fairly accurate reconstruction so I would like to be assured about the ongoing maintenance that it will be, because they, they soon look cutty and they soon will, can disappear. Um, so I would possibly, whether that's possible, to condition something in that 
The other thing is we do get people, especially now people who aren't swimming at Tinker, people walking by. I'm generally against on-site interpretation, but I think a small board would be also possibly a condition just to explain what it is. I'm sure most of the interpretation will be done in a different way. Um, and um, perhaps I could recommend as well that you look at the Cranog, which unfortunately burnt down in, near Kenmore in Scotland, and how the interior was used, because that was a really good example of people really getting an atmosphere, rather than just a bare building, the way they divided and they had archaeological evidence for. And finally, if it does have to be removed or demolished, you know, if it's no longer needed, then either it pretty immediate removal because it does look, can look tatty, or used as a research tool, so looking at how these buildings do disappear and looking at some, some kind of archaeology for real experiments, but, but not just to let it decay into the landscape without real thought. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Holton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a concern and a query. Um, we've just heard from Linda that the materials here are not long-lasting. As a surveyor, uh, with regard to thatch, the last thing that you need for thatch is to have it overhung by trees uh, because it will drip on it and disappear very quickly. And I'm wondering whether um, the proposers of this have, have considered that aspect and also whether if we condition it that we've got to put trees straight back around the, the hut, we are actually shortening its lifespan. So it's, it's just a, a practical query as to quite why we're dealing with it like that. Thank you. Would any officer like to address that? Thank you, Chair. Um, ju just on the, that last uh, point, um, as with any application, we're here to assess how it looks and what our view is in terms of the use of land. Ongoing maintenance will be the responsibility for the applicant, and I appreciate in this instance it's the Expo National Park Authority, but that, that doesn't change the consideration of the, the application. Now, in terms of the, um, the provision of, of further trees, um, there is no stipulation at the moment where they need to go, so they could go anywhere within the red line that you can see on that, that slide there. So that, that can certainly be taken into account when, um, when they're thinking about where, where that tree planting should, should go. Um, just on a couple of other points that were raised, there was reference to do with maintenance and whether that can be conditioned. It's not something we can particularly condition, uh, like with anybody's extension. We, we can't force them to paint it every two, two months or to patch up render. All, all we can do is, is grant permission in the first instance. What we can do is, is look to say, well, actually, if this building isn't used for a set period of time, then we would expect that building to be removed. And that sort of, in a roundabout way, deals with the deterioration of the building if it's no longer needed or of particular interest or value anymore. Um, and it's, it's similar conditions that we use for like telecommunication masks so I would suggest if it's not used for you know, 6, 9, 12 months, that's for members to decide, um, then, then we would say, OK, that, that, that facility should be removed from the site and, and, and that there be a, 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 a land restoration plan to go with it. Um, that, that would be the case. In terms of the ter interpretation boards, it's difficult because we're adding to the planning permission and we can't do that. So if that's a, a consideration, that's something that can be taken away and thought about and brought back if we need to, but we, we can add it to it. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chairman, I think what... what um, I'm not saying what he thought, but what I think Mr Holton was trying to say is that he hopes the applicant is hearing his concerns, as we would with any other application if we had something that had some noise. But he's absolutely right about that. Um, I suppose I'm just a bit concerned about these trees. I, I see that we've got to, the applicant has to submit a time frame for doing it. I would like to hear that the trees are being planted as soon as practically possible within the tree planting season. Yes, yeah, so the proposed condition seven on the update sheet talks about all planting contained uh, in the approved <coughs> details of the landscape scheme shall be carried out in the first planting season after the felling of the 
Sitka spruce trees. Right, anything else? Anything else on materials? No suggestion that it should be made out of cedral fibre cement? No, good. <coughs> right. You said just there, Mr. Per Chairman, you weren't yep. going to give an opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't giving one. I was merely asking whether or not you had one, Mr. Le right. It has been moved by Mr. Ellicott and seconded by Mrs. Blanchard that we should approve this application. May I see all those in favour, please? Uh, any against? Any abstaining? Right, so that is everybody with one abstention. Okay. Right, thank you very much. The next application, which is at Ashcombe Gardens, has been... Uh, we're suggesting that members should approve that it is withdrawn for the time being. Do you wish to say anything about that, Mr Kinsella? Just, just to clarify, uh, the officer recommendation has changed to defer the application um, purely because of there are some outstanding ecology matters that haven't been addressed in time. So uh, we suggest we bring it back to a, a, a later committee. Thank you. I'm just happy to agree to that withdrawal. Yes, no, thank you. So that then brings us to the end of the planning applications. We have the application decisions delegated to the chief executive. Is there anything that you wish to draw our attention to from the beginning, Mr Kinsella, or should we go through it page by page? There's always things I want to draw your attention to, Chair. Um, so just generally, uh, 37 delegated decisions over the last month. Um, of those, 90% of them were um, positive outcomes, which is, which is really good to see. Just to very quickly go through the list, because there aren't that many of uh, withdrawn and refused uh, applications. Um, I'll start from the front rather than the back. So on page two, um, you can see that uh, the third one from the bottom, Howtown Farm, has been withdrawn. Um, that is because of, uh, there is a need for ecology surveys um, and they can't be carried out till next year. So it was recommended they withdraw the application and resubmit. So that, that should be coming back to us. You can then see on page three, the top two items relate to the Chagas Estate. Um, and that was for a proposed single story rear extensions to, uh, uh, to a listed building. It was refused on the impact and the loss of historic fabric and the overall general design um, of, the, um, uh, of the proposal. Concerns were raised by the, the parish council as well, so um, it's one that we will wait to see if the applicant chooses to appeal or not. And then the final one is on page five, uh, which is the tithe barn in, in Dunster. It was merely withdrawn because it didn't require listed building consent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for those pointers, Mr Kinsella. So we'll go through it page by page. Anything on page one? Mrs Blanchard. I just wondered about HRN 2203. It seems rather a large section of hedgerow removal. I just wondered what the reasons were for that. Um, I, I don't think it met, it met the criteria for what would be a, an historic hedge row. So um, on that basis, the, the legislation is quite prescriptive in that, that regard. So we have to meet those certain criteria, and it, it, it didn't meet them. So it was considered acceptable. Page two. Page three. Page four. And page five. So um, how many did you say there were? 36, 38, 37. 37. Um, right, uh, at that point, I'm going to make one observation in the light of the conversation that we had earlier this morning. This afternoon, um, of the three applications, four applications we've heard, one we heard because it was a National Park application, three we heard because the parish councils had a view that was different from that of the officers. You as members have agreed with the parish councils on two of the three. The third, you agreed with the officers. So I just uh, lodge that one with you for your thought about uh, the delegation. But the vast majority of planning applications um, have been dealt with by the officers. So that is a bit of the context for the discussion that we may be having next year. Item 14, site visits to arrange any visits agreed by the committee. Well, at the moment, we don't have any. 
Um, something may arise, of course, if there are any applications that uh, come in that require us to see them in advance of being heard by this authority, but at the moment it doesn't look as though there will be any. So with that, I'm going to hand you back to the Chairman of the Authority to formally close the meeting after Mr Kinsella has said something. Thank you very much. Just very quickly, as you will be aware, we've, um, we've been trying to recruit to vacancies over the last few months, uh, and I think I recently reported that we were successful. Um, I just actually want to take the opportunity to introduce uh, two officers that we've got. So we've got Andrew Spires, uh, who's joined us as planning officer, and uh, Daniel Day Robinson, who's joined as assistant planning officer. So I thought just you can, you can see them, you have a face to the name. We wondered who these two very elegant gentlemen were sitting at the back of us, and now we know. <laughs> welcome, welcome, gentlemen. Right, well, thank you very much, members, for your attendance today, and I will declare the meeting closed. <laughs>